Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Brenham Presbyterian Church online. And whether you're a member here, a first-time visitor, or a returning visitor, please be welcome in our church. There's a lot going on in the life of the church uh, as we continue with the Advent season. We're glad you're with us this morning. We will now uh, begin the worship service with the lighting of the Advent candle. The candle of joy. Then shall the young woman rejoice in the dance, and the young men and the old shall be merry. I will turn their mourning into joy. I will comfort them and give them gladness for sorrow. Thus spoke the prophet Jeremiah. We wait for you, O Lord. Help us to live as a joyful people being comforted by you and comforting others. The candle of joy. Please join me in the responsive call to worship in your bulletin this morning. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Let us worship God together. I invite you to sing our opening hymn this morning, Lift Up Your Heads, Ye Mighty Gates. God, you come into our midst longing for communion with us, becoming one of us. As we assemble here today to praise you, break our resistance to life with you, show us the path toward just relations, and bring us into your unimaginable peace. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Sisters and brothers in Christ, if we say that we have no sin, then we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Let us therefore confess our sins before God and one another, first using the unison prayer of confession you'll find in your bulletin. Let us pray. Compassionate, forgiving God, we trespass on your mercy and take your favor for granted. We think only of ourselves. We forget the lessons of those who came before us and ignore our responsibility to those who will follow us. We grow proud and seek power. We do not see the destruction of our actions and how it distances us from you. We do not recognize our hunger for what it is or where it leads us. We grow faint. Forgive us, guide us, bring us home to you, merciful God. Let us continue with silent prayers of confession. Let us pray.
The Holy One forgives, especially when we are humble and lowly in spirit. Friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Three pieces of scripture this morning, actually two, one a long reading from Matthew. Our reading from the Hebrew Scriptures comes from Genesis chapter 15. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. He brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and count the stars if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. From the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 1 verses 16 through 25. Now the birth of Jesus the Messiah took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. But just when he had resolved to do this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you are to name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Look, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall name him Emmanuel, which means God is with us. When Joseph awoke from sleep, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded him. He took her as his wife, but had no marital relations with her until she had born a son, and he named him Jesus. Three readings from the Gospel of Matthew. And further contact between Joseph and the angel in a dream. An angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother by night, and went to Egypt, and remained there until the death of Herod. This was to fulfill what had been spoken by the Lord through the prophet, Out of Egypt I have called my son. When Herod died, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt and said, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel. Those who were seeking the child's life were dead. Then Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was ruling over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And after being warned in a dream, he went away to the district of Galilee. There he made his home in a town called Nazareth, so that what had been spoken through the prophet, through the prophets, might be fulfilled. He will be called a Nazarene. And finally, this reading from Matthew. He, that is Jesus, Jesus is now a grown man, came to his own town and began to teach the people in their synagogue so that they were astounded and said, Where did this man get this wisdom and his deeds of power? Is not this the carpenter's son? Is not this mother, is not his mother Mary? And are not his brothers James and Joseph and Simon and Judas? And are not all his sisters with us? Where did this man get all of this? Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This morning we encounter one of the most enigmatic people in the life of Jesus. He does not have the commanding power of someone like, say, a king like Herod. He doesn't have the charisma uh, of Jesus' uh, kin on his mother's side, John the Baptist, who was, after all, a charismatic problem. This man does not ask a lot of questions like Peter, the disciple, did. 
And he doesn't have the chutzpah to challenge an angel of God Almighty like Mary did. In fact, he has no direct speaking parts in the Bible at all, not one word. We never hear his voice directly. He's quoted nowhere by any of the various authors in the New Testament. In many ways, he is a mystery. His name is Joseph, and he is the husband of Mary, the stepfather of Jesus. Now, we really know very little about the historical character of this man, Joseph. But that didn't stop people from the 3rd to the 7th centuries of writing books to try to fill in all the gaps. And in fact, between those times, the 3rd and the 7th centuries, there are all kind of books that were written that were considered uh, to whether or not to be uh, placed in the canon of Scripture. Uh, some of those stories had Jesus actually delivering Joseph's uh, funeral sermon. Another one depicted Joseph as a man about 93 years old when he came into Mary's life with a family from a previous marriage. He was a widower, according to this, and really was more a caretaker to her because he was too old to have marital relations with her. Now, none of these views, none of them, square with Scripture. And as a matter of fact, these particular books of the Bible, or, or potential books of the Bible, I really should say, they were rejected over a thousand years ago. But many of those stories still persist, and in fact, they're inferences. And yet if we read carefully in Scripture, we can interpret some things about Joseph from the information that we do have from Scripture, and perhaps engage in a little inference of our own. Now, from Scripture, it appears that he had a normal marriage to his wife, Mary, particularly after the birth of Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew clearly states that Joseph had no marital relations with her until she had born a son. And apparently, they did live as husband and wife because Jesus apparently was part of a large family. Scripture gives witness that he and Mary had a more or less normal relationship for the time. Large families were common. We read in the Gospel of Mark that um, this morning that when he goes to the town of Nazareth, we said, brothers, that they ask, is that not this man? Is this he not the one who has the brother here? Is he not the brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? clearly stated in Scripture that he comes from a large family. And from what little we're told in Scripture, it appears that Joseph had a good relationship with Jesus, or at least a very caring relationship with Jesus. If you remember a story from the Gospel of Luke, when uh, they, they all go to Jerusalem and they suddenly find that the boy's been left behind, he's about 12 years old, and they search frantically for him everywhere. And Mary, a worried mother, gives her son a piece of her mind. She says, child, why have you treated us like this? Look, your father and I have been searching for you in great anxiety. Well, who was she referring to here? It's hard for me to believe if she's talking about God, because would God get anxious about anything? No, I think she's talking here about your father, meaning Joseph, which tells us perhaps something about the relationship. And while the word here is fairly formal, there's no reason to think why Jesus didn't call Joseph dad, just like his brothers and sisters did. He at least called him father. He apparently, Joseph did, had a good relationship with the boy, because you know what? You're only anxious about someone you really care about, right? There was a loving and caring relationship, I think, is a logical and firm. But the problem is that right after this story, Jesus, I mean, uh, Joseph, Joseph drops right out of the picture. We never hear from him directly again. And that leads to the widely held assumption that Joseph died. But that's exactly what it is. It's an assumption. No one knows. It doesn't say so. No one knows for sure what happened here. 
And even though Joseph says not one direct word in the New Testament, nevertheless, Scripture does give witness to the fact that God chose Joseph very carefully. And that Joseph was God's gift. He was God's gift to Mary, to Jesus, and to the world. Joseph was God's gift to Mary. In my sermon last week, I, I dealt with some of the dangers Mary would have faced and some of the anguish she would have faced when she consented to what the angel Gabriel proposed. She was in a real dilemma. As I mentioned last week, technically she could have been stoned to death under the book of Deuteronomy. That, of course, would have taken a trial and would have had to have witnesses and what have you. And even if she wasn't stoned, her life would have been one of isolation and shame. As would the life of the child that was within her. Her future and that of the child she was bearing was indeed in God's hands. Mary trusted that moment that she gave her assent. When she consented. But God chose Joseph as the earthly manifestation of those hands. And so it was that Joseph set out to father a child, in other words, act as a father figure, in a, a uniquely blended family. I've known and pastored to many folks who were step-parents. I myself am the proud stepfather of two wonderful daughters who are fully sisters to my biological daughter as she is a sister to them. Blended families have their own unique problems, but they can and they do work. And I have pastored to a couple of men in my life and actually performed a couple of weddings where the man married a woman who was carrying a child, and he was aware of it, that was not his, promptly adopted the child after it was born and raised the child as his own. But the sensibilities of the ancient world were very different. The world in which Joseph and Mary lived, lived by different rules. Joseph might have been open to adopting a child, Adoptions did happen in the ancient world. But marrying a woman carrying a child not of his line would have been almost unthinkable in his day. Especially given that he and Mary were engaged when all of this happened. Now engagements are broken off all the time in the modern world. But engagement in the ancient world was very different. Sometimes called a betrothal. An engagement was a very formal affair in the days of Joseph and Mary. It was a binding affair. It involved just not the two of them, but their two families in a financial, social, and emotional binding. And indeed, a betrothed couple in their day was considered to be as good as married. All that was needed were the formal vows. In fact, notice this morning in our reading that even though they're engaged, Joseph is specifically referred to as her husband. And here's the thing, in the ancient world of their day, it was not unheard of for a couple to, shall we say, consummate the marriage a little early. More than one woman said her public vows knowing that she was pregnant. But this was different. It's stated somewhat euphemistically here in the scripture, but it was different, and Joseph knew it. Our scriptures this morning read, when his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, that is, Jesus' mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, but before they lived together, she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. That phrase, but before they lived together, is a bit of a euphemism. More literally, it translates, before they came together. And that phrase is used more than once in the Bible as a euphemism for sexual relations. According to Matthew, Joseph was aware at this moment that this child was not his. 
And he was also aware of the possible consequences for Mary. At the very least, she would be exposed to, as Scripture puts it, public disgrace. Now again, as I pointed out last week, she could have been stoned. And if Joseph had pushed the issue, she probably could have been tried. But that doesn't seem to have entered Joseph's mind at all. He seems to be just more concerned about her living a life of public disgrace. On the other hand, if she had been stoned, that's the ultimate public disgrace, isn't it? But in any event, what Scripture tells us is that he wishes to save her from all of that. Scripture reads, her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man and unwilling to expose her to public disgrace, planned to dismiss her quietly. A righteous man. A righteousness for a Jew in the days usually proceeded from obedience to the Torah, every, every sort of letter, jot, and tittle, perhaps. But I don't think that's what's going on here. The righteousness of Joseph proceeds from his mercy. That is not to say the Torah could not be interpreted in a merciful way, it could. But here, I believe, we get some indication of who Joseph is. He's a righteous man, and he wants to do the merciful thing. And just when he decides to do this, when he's decided upon a merciful course of action for Mary, he has his own encounter with an angel. Now at this point, I wonder how much Joseph actually knows. You see, it's about here that all of us, I've done it too, assume that what's taken place before is that Mary has told Joseph the whole story about her meeting with Gabriel, etc., but that's an assumption. That's nowhere stated in here. We don't know what Joseph knew or didn't know. And I have a question. Speaking of inferences, what if she waited? What if she didn't tell him about her encounter with Gabriel? What if she waited for Joseph to have his own encounter, his own enunciation? What if her faith was strong enough that she believed that God would take a hand in this? That if God wanted them to be married and live as husband and wife, that he would treat them on equal footing, so to speak. A physical angel for her and a vision or a dream of an angel for him. And you can say that one is more important but from the other, but that's not true in the ancient world. A vision, a dream were very, very important in the ancient world. Well, we read about Abram this morning, how in a vision, God takes him up and shows him the stars. And Abram believed God. It was counted to him as righteousness. Visions, reality, they kind of blur together when God gets involved. Could it be that Mary waited? That she actually hadn't said anything about her meeting with Gabriel? That she wanted their marriage to start out on an even footing with respect to God. But whatever the case, Joseph has three, actually four, dreams. This isn't the only one, and he obeys every time. The first one is when he's told what is happening here, that she is pregnant by the Holy Spirit, that he shouldn't be afraid to take her as his wife, that he's to name the boy Jesus and so on, and he obeys. And then shortly after they're married, in a dream he's told, get up, go to Egypt, dislocate your family, become an illegal alien on the run. And he does it. And then he has a dream that says, okay, a couple of years have passed, go back. And then the other dream he has is when he's told, go to Nazareth. And in each case, Joseph obeys. This is not just obedience to God. This is radical obedience to God. All of it. A gift to Mary. Indeed, Joseph apparently worked hard to build a life with her as her husband. And he moved heaven and earth to keep them safe and to keep the child safe. Joseph obeyed God, and it was a gift to Mary. And I think Joseph was also God's gift to Jesus. 
Yes, I think Joseph was God's gift to Jesus. You know, I think all of us, I do it too, we, we tend to think, well, you know, Jesus was the Son of God. Somewhere along the line, you know, his, his heavenly Father took a hand. Jesus, do it this way. Jesus, don't do it that way. As if suddenly all of the knowledge he needed about the world just sort of sprung in his head. But if that's the way it actually happened, he's not actually human. Human beings learn by experience. They're shaped by their experiences. And most importantly, by the experiences of their families, their brothers, their sisters, their siblings, and their parents. And that includes step-parents. In this case, it includes the influence of his stepfather. And Joseph must have had an influence. You know, this morning we, we read that when the boy Jesus grows into a man, he comes home to Nazareth. And the people of the town say, where then did this man get all this? It's a good question. Where did Jesus get all this? When at the end of his ministry and earthly life, he calls God Abba, which means more or less daddy, a close, intimate relation. Where did he get this? When Jesus said, go and learn what this means, I desire mercy. Where did he get this? When Jesus said, blessed are those who hear the word of God and obey it, where did he get this? Could it be that Joseph's gift to Jesus was a gift not of words, but of action, of living into the words of mercy and obedience and love? He saw up close and personal. The love of a dad for his child. And yet scripture is silent. Joseph says not a direct word. We have no record of the words that he says directly to Jesus. We must infer it as I'm doing here. But could it be that the silence in scripture was not because Joseph was dead. But because that's what he wanted. Could it be that the one thing he asked was that his private life with his wife, his children, and even Jesus remain just that, his private life, not open to public scrutiny? Could it be that he didn't want his relationship and their family life to actually get in the way of Jesus' ministry? In a word, could it be that his gift to the world was also his humility? When Jesus said, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant. Where did he get this? In his book, The Journey, Adam Hamilton has pointed out that some people, actually many people in the world, go through life saying, hey, look at me, look at what I've done. But Joseph went through life saying, hey, look at God, look at what God did in the flesh and Joseph said it by saying nothing at all nothing at all his gifts were given by example to Jesus and to the world my friends when we look at Jesus when we when we listen to the words of Jesus we are looking at and listening to the man that Joseph helped shape Mercy, obedience, love, humility. These are good gifts for us to receive as well and to live into. Because by the hand of God, such was Joseph's gifts to Mary, to Jesus, and to us all. May God bless you all this Advent season. May the meditations of our hearts be pleasing to you, O Lord. Let us take a moment of silent reflection upon the word proclaimed. Using the ancient baptismal formula of the Apostles' Creed, you'll find it in your worship bulletin this morning. I believe in God, 
the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Please join me in praying for the state of the world, the state of our communities, the state of our nation. Let us pray. Lord God, we come together as your children, looking out on a difficult world, plagued by a pandemic, by war, by hunger, by pestilence and by so many wrongs of our own making. Reach out to us, O Lord. Straighten us out, O Lord. Help us to care for one another. Help us to look at the misery of the world head on. And as you make opportunities available to us, help us to reach out to those who are hurting. Lord God, we pray for those that continue to be on the front line of this pandemic. We particularly pray for those in South Africa scrambling to find genetic material for a rising variant. We pray for all of those who are sick, whether as a product of this pandemic or otherwise. We pray for all who are working so hard to care for the sick. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, we give you thanks for those in our community, for our first responders, for those who work hard to honor the jobs and the trust that they are given. We give you thanks, O oh Lord, for your church universal, for Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, and a Baptist, it makes no difference, Lord. Empower us to act together, to live into the words, one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Oh, Lord God, as we come together, we know that there are joys and concerns that for whatever reason we dare not speak aloud. We hold them now before you in our hearts in silence. Now, O Lord, as you have taught us, we are bold to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. There's a lot going on in the life of your church, and I'll announce just a couple of things on the worship uh, schedule, if I may. There'll be one physical worship service on December 19th at 11 o'clock. It is a special worship service where actually the proclamation of the word will come through music, and no, I'm not going to sing, but our wonderful choir uh, and accompanists are, have put together a nice program. Uh, so it's, it's kind of a cantata, but it also will all uh, focus a little bit on the Christmas pageant, which we normally do every year in camp because of the pandemic. We will be filming this as it happens, and it will be made available shortly after that uh, as we upload it to YouTube. So for those of you watching on YouTube now, on Sunday morning the 19th, uh, you won't have anything until we upload it uh, later that afternoon. But I think it'll be worth the wait. I can tell you the choir and everyone's worked really hard on it. 
Christmas Eve candlelight service will be held December the 24th, Christmas Eve, 5 p.m. Uh, physically in our fellowship hall to have more spacing. We have pre-recorded that and we will make that available on YouTube um, for you. Um, and so you can tune in and, and celebrate Christmas Eve. The Sunday after Christmas, December the 26th, which is my last Sunday uh, as your pastor, uh, we will have one worship service physically at 10 o'clock uh, here in the sanctuary. That one too has been pre-recorded. It will also be posted at the regular time. So please come and worship and join in worship with us as we move from Advent to Christmas tide and beyond. If you feel that you can share some of your financial resources to help support such ministries of which these kinds of worship services, including this one, are a part, we would be very grateful to accept your donations. Whether you donate online, which is at brenhampresbyterian.org backslash give, you can send a check uh, to uh, Brenham Presbyterian Church, 1005 Green Street, Brenham, Texas, 77833. That's a secure lockbox facility, and uh, we are a nonprofit. We do keep records. We're happy to send you a receipt. Now, if you are not in a position to, to give for whatever reason, but particularly in the pandemic, we would never ask anyone to give to this church if they themselves are in financial difficulty. Instead, what we would ask of you was simply this. Pray for Brunham Presbyterian Church. Pray for our missions, our ministries, our pastoral staff, our session of elders, our music ministries, for all who work, worship, and come here, whether physically or online. Because by doing so, you become part of the mission and ministry of Brenham Presbyterian Church, and your prayers are always welcome. Let us listen to our closing meditation music Praise, I will praise you, Lord, which will be followed by the closing doxology. Joseph gave a gift to the world by what he did, the example that he set for Jesus, the Savior of us all. Things such as obedience and mercy and love and humility. And there are people beyond the walls of this sanctuary 
whether physical or virtual, who have no such experience of those words from the Christian church, sad to say. So I charge you in everything you do, everything you say, touch another with the grace, the love, the humility, the obedience, the mercy of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. May the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all now and forevermore, sisters and brothers in Christ. Go in peace.